Welcome to Fayetteville Community Church. We welcome our church family and our visiting friends. Thank you for coming to worship with us. To find out more about our church, upcoming events, and other church activities, you may visit us online at www.fccnc.us. How many of you know that, there, that numbers are important? And, and numbers are important. How many, when, when uh, Noah took the animals inside the ark, how many did he take? Two of what? Uh, how many of every kind? Whoa, y'all are a smart crowd. We went to a wedding this weekend, and, and um, a guy was telling us at this wedding that a lady makes wedding cakes for them. And he was telling us that this lady had made a wedding cake specifically that this bride and groom had asked for. And they asked for a scripture. Jay, you're going to love this. They asked for a scripture to be put on their wedding cake because they were, you know, they were godly people, and they wanted a scripture on their wedding cake. So numbers make all the difference. Can you say Amen. Okay, if you'll look at this scripture, I'm going to show you the scripture. This is from 1 John, and this is what they wanted on their wedding cake. Look at the scripture. This is from 1 John, and it's chapter 4 and verse 18. Will you put that up for me, Rhonda? 1 John, chapter 4, 18. Put that up for me. <laughs> it's going to be great when it comes up. One more chance. Put that up for me. This is going to kind of ruin my thing. Let me find it. Because I want, I want to make sure that I get this whole thing. Hold on. You got it yet? Say yes. But if you turn to 1 John 4.18, it says this. For God is love. It says 4.17. Let me find 4.18. 4.18. God is love. And perfect love casts out all fear. That's what they wanted on their wedding cake. But what they got, the guy who did the cake left off the one from 1 John, which came out John 14, 18, which says this. Let me find this. What's four, verse John 4, 18. I'm sorry. John 4.18. Let me find it. Which John 4.18 says this. And Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, <laughs> the fact is you have had five husbands. <laughs> and the man you now have is not your husband. <laughs> what you have said is quite true. <laughs> So isn't it amazing what one little number made a difference in their wedding cake? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, if you were to ask Dolores McNamara of Lim Limerick, Ireland, in the past few years, has any number made a difference in her life? She would say absolutely. Because th that magic number for her was July the 31st of 2005. And it was on that day she went into a convenience store and she bought a ticket. And on that ticket were these numbers. 3, 19, 26, 49, 50, 4, and 5. Now she didn't think about it at the time. She didn't know that those numbers for her were going to be a magic number. And this is her. Look at this picture of her. Can we look at this picture of her? <gasps> she looks a lot like me. But anyway, there's another number that meant a whole lot to her, and that number was 156,369,776. There she is, Dolores. She doesn't look like me, praise God, or I don't look like her. But 150, 100, well, that's, that is in euros, but 156 million dollars. Now another number that's really important to her is when she won that lottery it made her the 72nd richest person in all of Ireland in one 
instant, in one minute. Now, this morning I'm going to talk to you about a number that I feel like is God's magic number. And I know some of you, some of you that are way more spiritual than me are going, oh, you can't talk about magic because magic is the devil. Just give me a break for a second. We're going to talk about God's magic number. But what I'm going to talk about is the jackpot of all jackpots. And what I'm going to talk to you about this morning is something that money can't buy, robbers can't steal, the government can't tax it, can we say amen? amen. And death can't take it away. You could call it the grand prize of Easter. And the number that I'm going to talk to you about, and, and again, some of you that are more spiritual than I am, when I give you this number, you're going to go, oh Lord, what is he, talk, what is he going to preach about this morning? How trivial is that? Absolutely. The number is 316. 316 Oyster Bar. <laughs> you couldn't have picked a better name. The most famous verse in all of the Bible has those numbers in it. And what, what would it be? John 316. Can you say it with me? Say it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, if you've never been to church before and you've never ever been to Sunday school, you probably won't know that. But if you have ever been to church and you've ever been to Sunday school and your mom and daddy were just a little bit, knew Jesus just a little, that's one verse that that you probably are at least a little bit familiar with. And I, I would bet there's not any other verse in the Bible that if I pulled John 4.18 or 1 John 4.18, like I was talking about a minute ago, that you would not be able to recite those verses. But that verse, all of us can recite. Now, this is what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. John 3.16. And you're like, boy, this couldn't get much more simpler. Absolutely. But in that verse, you're really talking about Christianity 101. You're talking about everything we believe as a church and everything we believe as a people. And if today is your first Sunday here and your last Sunday here, if your mom or your uncle or your aunt or your dad or whoever talked you into coming and wearing a bow tie today to church and this is it and I got one chance to talk to you before you leave, this is the one verse I want you to know. This is it. And if you've been in church for a long time and you think, well, I can sleep through this one, let me tell you something. There's something in this this morning that will change your life. It will absolutely change your life. Because if you look at this verse, the first half of this verse is all about God. And the first half says this, for God, so, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now the second half is about us. So let's look at the second half. The second half says that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now if you think about those two things, it's short enough to write on a napkin, but it's long enough to tell anybody and everybody everything that they need to know about what Christ is to us. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. And you can really shrink it down to four words. And here's the four words. Love, gave, believe, and have. Because basically this is what we get. God loves, God gives, we believe, and we receive. I want you to say it with me. God loves, God gives, we believe and we receive. Now, if you're witnessing to somebody and you want to use this verse, you can explain it this way. God loves and God gives. And we believe, he receives. We believe and we receive. How much simpler can it be for all of us? That's, like I said a second ago, that's Christianity 101. Now, to me, I believe that 316, that that, this, that, that, that would be... A number that if Jesus himself were here and he could preach one verse, he'd preach this one to us. He would preach this one. Because it talks about everything that he was and everything that he did and everything that his father did for him and everything that we have because of him. So let's look. So number one, because of this we can experience God's love. We can experience God's love. Now the first part says, for God so what the world? Love. For God so loved the world. Let me ask you something this morning. How many of you are in the world? Not a quick question. How many of you are in the world? Everyone in the house. Everyone here. We're all in this world. Me, so if you're in the world, this includes you. You made the list. It may be the only list you've ever made. But you made the list. Why? 
Because God loves everybody. For God so loved the world. He loves everybody. Look, there's nobody in the world that God doesn't love. He is yet to find a person that he doesn't love, no matter in spite of what they're doing or what they've done. You just, the, the only prerequisite for God to love you is just show up. Just show up. Where? Wherever. In the world. For God so loved the world. He loved me. He loved the world. It doesn't even, it, it doesn't even matter if, you've, uh, if you believe him or you don't believe him. He still loves you. It doesn't matter how many times, listen, that you've turned your back on him. Or how many times that you've walked away from what you really understand and what you really know. It doesn't matter how many times you've disobeyed him. Or how many times that you've really kind of denied him. Or how many times that you have used his name incorrectly. He still loves you. He still loves you. Does he want you to do it? No. But he still loves you. And if you look back in 1 John where I was a minute ago. 1 John 4.16 says God is love. He doesn't just love. He is. The, the reason that you're alive right now is because God loves you. He made you in order to love you. He made man at the beginning because he wanted somebody to hang out with. How cool would it have been to have been Adam in the garden and God wanting to hang out with you? He didn't love you because you're good. He doesn't love you because you deserve it. He doesn't love you because you love him back. He loves you without any preconditions and without any guarantee of anything in return. How much better can that be? If you're wondering this morning, he doesn't love you with just like a national love. Because he loves the Americans and he loves the Russians and he loves the Jews and he loves the Gentiles. It's not political. He loves the Democrat as much as he loves the Republican. It's not a racial love. He loves the whites and the blacks and the Hispanic and whoever the same. It's not that. It's not financial. It's not what you can give or what you can't give because the Bible says he loves the rich and the poor both. It's not physical. He loves the deformed just as much as he loves the beautiful. Look at the person beside of you and say, God, I'm glad of that. I'm so glad of that. I'm glad of that. It's not intellectual. It's not how smart you are. Look at the person beside of you and say, I'm really glad of that. It's a, he loves the ignorant and he loves the educated. It's a total love. He loves anybody and everybody. Let me, let me put it an, a, another way. God loving you has nothing to do with you. Now, it, it's, now, other people may be attracted to you loving them because what you can do for them. Have, have you ever had that? Or what, what appeals to them? Or how that hanging out with you can influence them or how you hanging out with them can influence you. But see, God doesn't love you because of you. God loves you because he is love. He's everything. God is love. You can't influence it. You can't turn him around. You can't do something. Here's, here's the great thing. You can't do something so good to make God love you more. And the cool thing about that is you can't do something so bad that's going to make him love you any less. Which is absolutely freeing to me and thankful to, to me. Psalm 89.2 says, God's unfailing love will last for." Ever. It never wears out. It never ends. It never fails. God's love is there on the good days and the bad days. He loves you on your worst. He loves you on your best. He loves you when your hair looks great. And he loves you when your hair looks bad. He, loves, he doesn't love you more today than he did yesterday. He doesn't love you less today than he will tomorrow. Because you see, there's one little verse. There's one little word in that verse that we kind of just skim over. And it's at the very beginning. And it says, for God so loved the world. Not like so, so, suck your tail all the way to Mexico. Not that one. But God so loved the world. God doesn't just say he loves us. He said he loves us so. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God provided his love by the giving of his son Jesus. In 1 John 4, 9, 9 and 10, it says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This love is real. Not that we loved God, but 
that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Think about it. To show us that he loved us, he didn't send an angel or an ambassador. He gave us his son. I heard about a guy one time that uh, he told his girlfriend, he said, baby, I love you so much. That I love you so much that I, would, I could just die for you. And finally she looked at him and said, you keep saying that, but you never do it. <laughs> she loved that. <laughs> you keep saying that, but you never. It's not like Forrest Gump was his girlfriend. <laughs> but God did it. God did it. Because look, when you love you give. And that's what he did. When you love, you give. Think about it. If God had not given his son in birth, and if Jesus had, listen, if, and if Jesus had not given his life in death, there would be no Easter bunny. <laughs> There'd be no Easter. But there'd be no hope. There'd be no forgiveness. There'd be no heaven. It wouldn't be anything. But Jesus loved me and you enough to give. To give. To give. So number one, we can experience him. Number two, let's embrace him. Let's embrace him. We can embrace God's grace. Now God loves us so much that he has given us the greatest present of all in his son Jesus. How many of you know that? How many of you have experienced that? How many of you have embraced that? He didn't give it to us because we deserved it. He didn't give it to us because we earned it. He gave it to us just because he loved us. But you know the one thing you've got to do with a gift? Receive it. Somebody gives you the most incredible gift and you leave it under the tree at Christmas time and you never open it. I mean, it's the thought that counts. But... It's a pretty rotten gift if it's going to stay under the tree and you never open it. Because then you never really experience the joy of opening the present and receiving the present. And the person who's giving the gift never really receives the joy of seeing you open it or getting it. So for a gift for somebody to give you, the only way that we can bring them joy is to open it up. Embrace it. To take it in. To take it in. But, but people every day go through this life without ever, out ever unwrapping the greatest gift that they could ever receive. Let me tell you something this morning. God has a gift for you. And the way that you unwrap and accept his gift is one way. You think, well, this is not tangible. It's not something I can take the bow off of. It's not something that I can cut the tape off of and open up. No, you have to receive it. You have to believe. To receive it, you've got to believe. That's why so many people have such a hard time understanding the concept of, of grace. Because a lot of times we really don't have grace to offer each other. We really don't. So we don't understand the concept of somebody giving us something and, and not expecting anything in return. I, 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 read a, I read a story the other day about a guy named David Hagler. And Joe, I thought about you and, and uh, Steve now, Jer Jeremy, I don't know if Jeremy Brewington's here this morning, but I thought these guys are, are my highway patrol buddies. But uh, I read a story of a guy the other day that was uh, an umpire. He was an umpire in a men's baseball league. His name was David Hagler. And he told the story of one day he was driving too fast, and a guy pulled him over and was going to give him a ticket. And he told, uh, he told the, the policeman that was going to give him the ticket. He tried his best to talk him out of it. He said, look, I'm, man, I, please, I'm so worried about my insurance going up and my rates going up. And, and honestly, I'm a really careful driver, and I just really wasn't paying attention. And he begged him for grace, and the officer just wouldn't budge. And so the um, umpire told the officer that, or, the, or the, uh, the officer told the guy who was the umpire, he said, you know, you just go and, and uh, just go to court, and whatever you can do in court, you know, that's what you have to do. So about a month later, it came to be the very first game of the Men's Community Baseball League. And Hagler was behind the plate. He was the umpire behind the plate. And it just so happens that the same policeman that wrote him a ticket was the first batter to walk in the batter's box that day. And so Hagler recognized the policeman, and the policeman reg recognized Hagler. 
and his face turned kind of white, and the policeman asked the umpire, he said, how did it go with that ticket thing? Um, umpire looked at him and said, all I got to say is you better swing at everything. <laughs> it was his big, boom, out. Because, see, that's the way we operate. The way we operate is if, if you don't help me, I'm not going to help you. If, if you don't cut me a break, I'm not going to cut you a break. I am so thankful this Easter Sunday morning that that's not the way God operates. No matter what you've done and no, how, no matter how far you've come, the moment that you believe in Jesus Christ, the moment that you believe in Jesus Christ, you receive forgiveness and eternal life. The moment that you receive Jesus Christ, you receive forgiveness and eternal life. The moment that you receive it, the moment that you believe it, you receive forgiveness and eternal life. Can I say it one more time? The moment that you believe Him, you receive forgiveness. Some of you have never experienced that. There are a lot of people that, who think they believe in Jesus but believing is, isn't just knowing something. Believing is trusting. Believing is trusting. There was a recent poll, a Gallup poll, that said this. 82% of all Americans that say this, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Big deal. Guess who else believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The devil. I'm sure he has a pretty well understanding of who Jesus is. But I bet you this too. Even though the devil believes in him, you ain't going to find him in heaven. That's pretty good preaching there, ain't it? Because you see, the word believe means to commit to, to surrender to, or to trust in completely. To commit to to surrender to or to trust in completely. Now, I believe in Karl Marx. I believe he existed. I believe he founded communism. But I'm not a communist. I believe in Hitler. But I'm not a Nazi. I believe in Osama bin Laden. But that doesn't make me a member of Al-Qaeda. But I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm a Christian. Why? Why? Because my mind knows the truth about Jesus. My heart has affirmed the truth about Jesus. But my will has committed my life to Jesus. My will has committed. I've made a commitment through my belief system for Jesus Christ. My mind knows the truth about him. My heart has affirmed the truth about him. But my will, what I decide to do with my life, has committed my life to Jesus Christ. Listen, you, you, you really need to understand this believing part of this verse. Because if you look at this, it says this. Whosoever believes in him, whoever commits to him, whoever wants to take everything that they have and throw at him, whoever believes in him, shall, shall not perish. Jesus posted for all of us big signs all over hell that say do not enter. And they flash at us all the time. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave that whosoever believes in him will not perish. You don't have to perish. If you, if you want to go to hell, Jesus said, You're going to have to do it over my crucified and my dead body. And my resurrected body. Some people will receive eternal life and some people will perish. But one thing will determine the difference, and that's belief. That's your, your belief. What are you committed to? Am I going to give everything that I have to him? God so loved that he gave, Jesus before, he gave Jesus for you. He so loved you that he gave himself for you. He died. He was buried. He was raised from the dead so that you could have a relationship with him. So what happens? What happens when you take that step and you believe? What happens when you experience what he's given you? What happens when you take it in and you embrace it? That's number three. You enter into his home. So you experience it, you embrace it, and then you enter. You go in. He says this. Here's the back half of that verse. 
Here's the result. For whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Eternal life. You know what eternal life is? It's your ticket. It's your ticket to heaven. Remember when you believe, you receive? Look, th there's some people that think that, that you have to wait until you die to find out whether you're going to go to heaven or not. They, they think that you're going to have to wait until you take that last breath or un until something happens to you, and then all of a sudden you're dead, and then you open up that one eye going, did I make it? <laughs> but that's not what the Bible says. Look what the Bible says in 1 John 5, 13. It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. It doesn't say you're going to wake up one day and go, did I squeak in? I, my mom was really good, and I know my mom knew Jesus, so did I make it? And the answer to that is, hell no. <laughs> Heaven, yes. <laughs> hell no. <laughs> Sorry, Victor. <laughs> I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know. If you don't know this morning, then you have never embraced Him. You've never truly experienced Him. If you don't know that when you take your last breath on this earth, that the next time you open your eyes, you're going to be in the presence of Jesus, then today's your day. The moment that you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, God gives you eternal life. It's not what you're going to get, but it's what you already have. And, and, and listen to these two statements back to back. John 5, 24 says, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. Has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from what? Death to life. And look at this next one. John 6, 47 says, I tell you the truth. He who believes in me will have what? Everlasting life. See, eternal life doesn't begin for you when you die. It begins when you believe. It begins when you embrace. It begins when you commit to. It begins when you change your way of thinking. Listen, think about the word eternal. A really long time. A really long time. Eternal life. Listen, you, you, you need to wake up and realize that this is a true life and death matter. Because if you don't embrace Jesus, heaven, yes. There you go. How would it be if you knew that when you die and they put that grave marker on there, that eternal life was not yours? I can promise you, eternal life is longer than what you're going to have on this earth. So what are, we, what are we giving this earth? Three score and ten, 70 years. Dad's been here 80 years. Aunt Pearlie, how long have you been here? 88? 88 years? Anybody older than 88 this morning? But that's not it. That's the dash in between everything that we're doing. What happens after that is the eternal part. You better realize this, that you're going to spend far more time on the other side of death in eternity than you're going to ever spend on this side of death. So what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? If eternity is waiting on the other side, then you better go into eternity with eternal life. If, if everything that God says is true, and, and, and undoubtedly maybe you wouldn't be here this morning if you didn't kind of believe that, that, that there, there kind of may be a God, and I kind of believe he sent Jesus, and I believe this is a pretty holy week, and not, I mean, I was off Friday, so it got to be something about it. You know? I know they've taken away Easter Monday, but still. I, I was off for three days, so there's got to be something about Easter. Go put that back up one more time, Rhonda. If eternity is waiting on the other side, then you better go into eternity with eternal life. And how can you know? Is it when you take the last breath and you close your eyes? Absolutely not. 
Absolutely not. I love, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big sports fan. Y'all know that. I mean, I, I, I love sports. And, and when Tim Tebow was playing at the University of Florida, I loved Tim Tebow. I, I just, if you don't like Tim Tebow, I don't care. But I, I, loved, I loved watching Tim Tebow. I just thought he was a good kid. And then he played in the NFL, played for the Broncos for a while. And I mean, had a great, um, a, a good career, I guess, until they cut him. But um, Tebow, when he was playing football, he always would write a scripture up underneath his eye in his, in his eye black. And um, before his championship, before one of his championship games, when the University of Florida was playing a championship, it was, he was an underclassman. He always wrote a verse from the book of Philippians. And when he went into the national championship this particular year, he really prayed about it. And for the very first time, he changed his verse. And you guys that are sports guys, you, you kind of wear the same socks. Or you wear the same underwear. When, you know, when you're going good, you kind of do the same thing. You don't go in, into the playoffs and change something. You just kind of keep your mojo going on. But he prayed about it, and, and the Lord just kind of told him for that final championship game, change your verse to John 3.16. So he did it. If you'd watch the game, that's what he had. That's what he had up under his eyes. And just keep that up for a minute. Now, the most amazing part of the story was really not how well they performed that night because Florida won that night, and they won the national championship. The thing that's crazy about this is after Tim Tebow did this and he wore John 3.16 on his face, his um, public relations guy from the University of Florida came to him and said, Hey, Tim, did you know you set a record two nights ago at the national championship? And Tim said, What? What, what record? He said, he said what, what record are you talking about? He said, Do you know for the next 24 hours that after our championship game, John 3.16 was Googled 93 million times. 93 million times. Now, or where's TJ? Goggled. E either Googled or goggled, whichever one you want to call it. But up until that time, up until that day, nothing else had ever been Googled that much. 93 million times in, in a two-day period. Now, they asked Tebow right after that, they asked him, was he going to, he was a junior, and they asked him, are you going to skip your senior year, and are you going to go on to uh, the pros, or are you going to stay in Florida for your senior year? And Tebow said this, he said, I'm going to stay at the University of Florida, and they said, why? In the interview, he said, I have 93 million reasons that I'm going to stay at the University of Florida. What a door that had been opened to him. What an opportunity that he had to tell somebody about Christ Jesus. So for Tim, there was two magic numbers for him, 316 and 93 million. Now for you, the magic number has come down to this. One. And that number is you. What am I going to do with 316? You see, God gives, God loves. It's awesome. Tell him we said hello. What are you going to do about 316? You see, God's done his part. God loves, and God gives. But it's up to you. Number one, are you going to believe or are you going to receive? Now, some of you have already done this before. But if you haven't, or if you're not positive that when you close your eyes, that your next time that you open your eyes, you're going to be in the midst of Jesus. I'm going to make it so easy you can't miss it. I'm going to pray a prayer with you this morning. You don't even have to close your eyes. If it freaks you out to close your eyes, you're okay because the Bible says watch and pray, so you're good doesn't matter. All right. You can keep them open, and you can watch this prayer on the screen. You can look at it with me. You can speak it out loud, or you can speak it in your heart. But if you're willing right now to make 316 that number for you, if you're willing to make Easter Sunday 2015 eternity that you, number one, in your world, will remember for eternity, I want you to pray this with me right now. And it's on the screen. It says, 
Pray this with me. If, in fact, if everybody prayed, I would love for you to. Pray it with me. Say, Dear God, I confess your son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord. I believe he died for me, and you raised him from the dead. I repent of my sin, and I ask you for your forgiveness and receive your free gift of eternal life. That's it. That's it. That's all you got to do. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. just be with me just for two minutes if this morning if you prayed that prayer for the very first time if today was the first time that you've ever prayed that prayer the sinner's prayer basically I'd like you to come this morning and let me welcome you into the family what a day to come and to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here this morning that prayed that prayer for the first time? Come on, man. Come on, man. Yes. 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 Stay right here. Is there anybody else this morning that prayed it for the first time that was come to stand with this bold young man? Say, Pastor, that's me. That's me. That's me. Yes. Come on, brother. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if there's anybody else here this morning, yes, there's another one. Come on. Come on. Yes. Yes. Come on. Yes, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Come on. There may be some of you here this morning that said, Pastor, when I was a little kid, I prayed that prayer, but I, am, I have been unsure about my salvation. I have been unsure because of everything that I've been through since I was a kid that I, when I closed my eyes, it was going to be the last time. If you're unsure this morning and you prayed that prayer, I want you to come down this morning and let me shake your hand and assure you that because you have believed, because you have received, there is no taking that away from you and you are guaranteed of eternal life. So today, if you were in question and today you prayed that prayer and you're believing with everything you are that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's forgiven you of your sin, I want you to come down this morning and let me shake your hand and assure you that you're going to be with me in paradise. That you're going to be with me just like Jesus told the thief. He said, I assure you today that you're going to be with me. So if you're unsure, you say, Pastor, I, I prayed it when I was a kid, but I didn't really know what I was doing. But today I prayed it and I understand of the gift that you've given me. Anybody, come real quick. I want you to know that you know that you know that you know. Yes. 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 Anybody else? Yes. 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 Thank you. Anybody else? Come quick. Come quick. I'm going to let you go. Somebody come and stand. Come on, darling. I love that. I'd like for somebody to come and stand behind. Come on, baby. Come on, darling. Come on, darling. Yes. Y'all, God is good in the house this morning. Pull it over there, Tracy. Come on, darling. I say, 
And I would just love for somebody to come and touch every person that's here. But somebody would love to. Thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Just help me pray with each one. Go come pray with them all. Come, Dad. Go help. Just pray with each one of them. Thank you, Lord. Isn't the cool thing is that we can't earn any of this? We can't earn it. It's not on the merit system. All we can do is receive it. All we can do is receive it. All we can do is receive it. Tim, come here. Sasha. Pray for the young man right in the middle. Pray for him right there, right behind Daddy. Here you go. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray together, Father. I thank you so much for everyone that has come to this altar this morning, Lord, for all of these that have come and made that confession for the very first time. Father, I ask you that you put your angels around them, that you touch them, and Lord, you don't let anybody talk them out of what they have received today. Jesus, you promised us that the moment that we believe and the moment that we receive, that eternal life is ours. So we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that you loved us so much that you gave us Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift that you've given us, Lord. And I thank you so much for each one of these that have come this morning to believe and to receive what you have for them. So, Lord Jesus, I just pray for them. And I just ask you in the congregation, how many of you would be willing to pray for these this week that have accepted the Lord today? That you will lift them up. That you will pray that God puts his angels around them, puts his ministering angels around them, and protects them. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this Easter Sunday morning. And we thank you that the angels in heaven, the angels in heaven right now are rejoicing for the saints that have come home. The angels in heaven are rejoicing. And let me tell you, if the angels are rejoicing, I promise you, that gives us the right to hoop and to holler and to say amen and to say hallelujah and to be thankful for what's going on on this earth. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for these souls. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just look at somebody and say, it's been good to be in church this morning. God bless you. We'll see you this week. Yes.